And now, our feature presentation. This is a sword made out of solid stainless steel. Tonight's first guest uses swords like this one when he performs. Ladies and gentlemen, the incredible Count Desmond. Three, four, five. I can count, isn't that amazing? <laughs> the blades actually pass a fraction of an inch from my beating heart at one point. years ago, a dying woman found new homes for her ten children. It was a final act of love. Tonight, you'll see the reunion of this family nearly three decades later. I'm Fran Tarkenton. Tonight, a story of going from riches to rags and then back again. John Davis II had it all until a traffic accident left him with severe brain damage. He lost his job, his home, and his family. He became a derelict but he never lost his will to survive. I'm Kathy e. Crosby. People always say, I never win anything. And that's what this woman said until it happened. Defying odds of more than 16 million to one, she won a million dollar lottery. All this and more. Tonight on. That's incredible. <laughs> First story takes us into the world of sports. In order to be a star basketball player, you need speed, agility, and above all, height. We're about to meet two players who are a little on the short side. On the court, you have to decide, are you a man or a mouse? For these two players, it's an easy decision. Everyone knows the basketball exploits of Julius Irving. Known as Dr. J, he has set record after record. No less impressive is the expert form of basketball great Larry Bird. These two men have served as the inspiration for two new players. Here's the miniature court for these new players. They practice for months under the watchful eye of their trainer. My name is Paul Wood, and I'm a recent graduate of DeKalb High School in DeKalb, Illinois. I trained two rats through operant conditioning to play basketball. The idea first came about when I was talking to a psychology teacher here at the high school named Dr. James Devine. We decided to, rather than do the usual maze training or something mundane, to try to take on something a little more challenging. The rats were placed inside the box here, and they responded to the food, which is a reinforcement for the behavior they did in here. So when they did the right behavior, they were reinforced for it by hearing the tone. These tones let the rat know that he had done the right behavior and therefore he got food. The first step, which was just getting the rat to go over and pick up the ball, took about, two, took about a month and a half. The next step, which was getting the rat to move the ball near the basket, took about two months. And the final step, the longest step, was actually where the rat lifted the ball up and put it through the basket. The last step took two and a half months. Hello again, everybody. For tonight's game, we have with us two very special guest stars, the Doctor, Dr. J, and Larry Bird. They have accepted the challenge to meet here tonight at the arena to play one-on-one -on -one to determine the all-around best shooter in the world of basketball today. Bill Baker along with you. We have a jam-packed arena here tonight. It's standing remotely. Every seat has been taken. As coming in from the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the doctor, 
Dr. J. And in from the right-hand side, the pride of Massachusetts, if you will, number 33, Larry Bird. Our official tonight is Paul Wood. He is standing by at center court, and we're set for basketball action to determine who is going to be the overall best. Jump tip taken to the drive line. Larry Bird has it. Fakes left, comes right, goes down the lane, and pushes it up and in. Two nothing lead. Quick two points to the board for Larry Bird. The doctor comes right back. He powers his way inside. We've got the two two draw. Loose basketball back to the drive line. Dr. J comes up with it. Steps down the lane. One hands it up, and he'll hit it. Four two. You'll see the replay. Watch how Bird gets caught inside. The doctor steps with one foot, then with the other. The power of the ball in, it's a 4-2 lead and a great play. Larry Bird tussles forward underneath the bucket, comes away with it, takes it the length of the floor, slams it home, and again, we've got the tie this time at 4-4 as he goes over the top of the basket. Here comes Dr. J with a nice move, gets past his man, he'll put it up and in, not that fancy, but he got the job done nonetheless. 6-4, Dr. J, loose basketball, look out, Dr. J with a bit of a leg grab, Larry Bird's going to take advantage of it, he'll push it up and in. It's a 6-6 tie, everybody, great move in the timeline by Dr. J as he caught his man going the other way. There's the replay again. Bird moving one side. Dr. J came around behind him and dropped it home. It's an 8-6 game. Again, the steal in the backcourt. Dr. J threatening to break this one open. Comes down the lane. Two-handed stuff is good. 10-6. Loose again in the corner. And again, Dr. J with it. Bird trying to take it away. Can't do it. J wheels in the corner. Along the baseline. Up and good again. It's 12-6. Dr. J's lead is a half dozen. Bird comes away with it. He narrows it down to 12-8 to with his slam dunk at the other end. You'll see the replay on that one as he stiff arms his man to the head but he didn't get caught. He didn't get caught. The bucket is going to count. It's a 12-8 tally in favor still of Dr. J. Doctor at the timeline. Wheels away. Wheels out through the timeline. Comes back down the lane. Loses Larry Bird in the process. It's 14 away to the great move for the doctor. He's back up six. Dr. J fights with it out to the right-hand side. Powers his way up. Gets over the top of Larry Bird. It's 16 to eight. Steals it again. The bird inside. Tries to knock it out of there. They'll not call the goaltending. The bucket was already good. Dr. J, as you see in the replay, already had the bucket. Good as he had the ball down to the hole. As Larry Bird frantically tried to dig it out of there, but to no avail. It's 18 to eight. Time running down. A consolation basket. That's all this is. 18 to 10 is going to be your final. And that's the end of the game. Dr. J is the champion. 18 to 10. For Dr. J, time to wind down. Following a hard fought victory. And for Larry Bird, back to the drawing board. And maybe another try next year. It all started with $2 spent on lottery tickets. For a woman who lived in Lincoln, Illinois, one of them was the dollar that changed her life. Every year, millions enter the Illinois State Lottery, hoping their dream will come true. Here's one dream that did. Like many of us, Karen and Stephen Shanley have daydreamed about how they would spend a million dollars. We're a family of five, and uh, having to raise three kids was no easy chore, you know. In order to help with the bills, I had to work, and I worked at a Lincoln Developmental Center. I worked as a supply clerk, and it was a lot of lifting and walking, and we had to go out in bad weather, too. But if you have to do it, you have to do it. The Shanleys were living from paycheck to paycheck. At the checkout line, Karen always wondered what it would be like not to have to watch every penny spent. There was always one indulgence she permitted herself. I would get my shopping done, and afterwards I'd go by the little window where we purchased the lottery ticket, and I would always buy two. Once in a while I'd win a free ticket, two dollars or five dollars, but nothing ever bigger than that. Well, we have instant lottery games in Illinois in which you win instantly. That's how we create millionaires with our lottery games. Karen became one of 30,000 people approximately who won 25 or 50 dollars in the 7-Eleven 21 instant game, and therefore qualified to be in the preliminary million dollar grand prize drawing. Three months passed before they heard any more news. One day we got a letter in the mail and it told me that I was one of 12 finalists in the million dollar drawing. But I just didn't want to get my hopes up and I really didn't think I could win. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Illinois State Lottery's 7-11-21 game millionaire drawing. The suspense was almost more than Karen could bear. Only two names were to be selected out of 12 finalists. The first runner-up is announced. Ray Lysak. Would you come up, please? Now 11 names were bobbing in the drum, but only one more runner-up would have a chance to win a million dollars. A hush fell over the crowd in suspense. Kay 
Shanley. When I found out that I was one of the final two, I was, I was just, didn't even know where I was. I was just so excited. I could not believe that I had even gotten that far. Two secret envelopes were put in place. The ladies were told one envelope was for $50,000, the other a million dollars. A toss of the coin determined who would open each envelope. You may do so. One, two, three. A local reporter described the exciting events this way. The million dollar winner, 29 year old Karen Shanley of Lincoln, Illinois. A supply clerk for the government, Mrs. Shanley and her husband Stephen have three children. The new millionaire said she bought the winning ticket shortly before Christmas. At the time, she never dreamed she'd be celebrating Christmas in June. We're going to celebrate tonight. Better call work. <laughs> the Shanleys had reason to be jubilant. They would be getting $50,000 a year for 20 years. That's before taxes. When my husband and I first got the check, we were kind of curious what all that money would look like. So we went up to the bank and we asked the girl if she'd cash it for us. Well, she looked at us kind of funny, but said, yeah, I guess we can. So pretty soon they wheeled it out of the vault on this cart and they started piling it up in front of me. And we couldn't believe it. It was more than we'd ever seen in our lifetime, that's for sure. They put that money to use right away. The first thing we wanted to do was buy a car. And my husband always wanted a Bronco. And he was looking at that one, and while he was doing that, I was looking at this little red car. And I really fell in love with it. So we finally decided just to take both of them. Their buying frenzy didn't stop there. The Shanleys made plans for an even bigger purchase, a vacant lot up the street from where they live. They hope to build a dream house there. But even more meaningful, the lottery has brought them something you can't put a price tag on. The most important thing to me in winning the money was being able to quit work and spend more time with the kids and be more involved with them, being able to see them grow up more. Like most people, the Shanleys never believed this could happen to them, always someone else. They don't think that way anymore. We'll see Sword Swallower Count Desmond in action as he demonstrates what else besides swords he can swallow. We'll see the reunion of a family separated 28 years ago. All this and more when That's Incredible continues. <laughs> This next story is in the category of incredible inventions, and it is incredible. In the past, we featured stories on new devices that allow the disabled to move about, but we've never seen one before that allowed them to move so far, so fast. Since the summer of 1960, Rexford Smith's life has been limited by a wheelchair. It was then that a freakish accident made him a quadriplegic. About 22 years ago, I was diving into the water and hit uh, an object under under the water. It caused damage to my spinal cord and left me uh, immediately paralyzed. Rex retained a very limited use of his shoulders, arms, and hands. But that was little consolation to a man who loved an active life, a vital life filled with sports. The things that Rex had treasured most were suddenly taken away. Among them was the favorite pastime of motorcycling with his brother. After my injury, I didn't think I'd ever ride a bike again. I figured uh, about as close as I would get to riding a motorcycle would be to touch one. In 1978, Rex's younger brother Fred would start to prove that notion wrong. The main problem with motorcycle is that they do have handlebars, so we eliminated the existing handlebars and built new steering equipment. Since all the parts on the bike I had to change, and I had to build everything. Uh, you couldn't go out and buy uh, what I needed over a period of about two years, it took uh, about 3,500 hours to build. It was a painstaking labor of love and a feat of ingenuity. Everything had to be devised so he could uh, operate each uh, piece of equipment with one hand, such as the brakes, steering, uh, the reverse, the throttle. Once he was on the bike, we had to figure out the ways uh, to keep him on the bike, such as a uh, blocking device. And everything had to be set so he could 
bump a control or nudge a control and it would safely lock him and be secure in, in the SI car. Then came the crucial test drive to see if everything worked. The bike functioned and handled perfectly. An unqualified success. Fred christened his invention the American Chariot. But before it could go on the road, it had to be certified street safe by the California Highway Patrol. Once we looked at the motorcycle, I was a little surprised that everything seemed to be at that time legal. Although it was different, uh, it had all the requirements that a motorcycle is required to have. The day had finally come for Rex to take a ride. The first time I actually got on the bike and just sat on the thing, uh, I was pretty nervous about the whole thing uh, because I didn't know what might, what might happen with the thing. Although it looked like, uh, from the way Fred built it, it would work. Fred's design was outstanding, perfect in every detail, including a ramp for the wheelchair. Just ramp up. Ramp up. Just a lock automatically right here. Once Rex's wheelchair locks into position, the ramp can be easily raised by the simple touch of a switch. Click into position automatically. When he raises it, it'll raise your lever. Give it a try. Give it a shot. I want to make sure it's touched and holds your weight. Keep going. Good. Everything's been designed to easily accommodate Rex's limited control of his hands and arms. That's brakes. Brake. Right. Good. Yeah. Throttle right That's there. Yeah. When I did finally uh, ride the bike, I thought it was just terrific. And, uh, it didn't take long to really, uh, to really appreciate what I had. The first time Rex got on the bike, and actually drove it. The little look on his eyes was, uh, it was beautiful. It was just uh, sparkling. You know, you could, uh, you could see it, the, the change. But when I finally was able to, to actually get the bike on the road and ride it, I felt some things that I, I hadn't felt for, for many years since I rode last on a motorcycle. And uh, it, was, it was just a terrific feeling of being, uh, being able to, to ride that motorcycle on out in the open, you know, with the wind going by, you know, and the, the sound of the, the motorcycle. It's just a great feeling to, to be out there on it and um, to have other, other bikers realize that this is a motorcycle just like theirs, even though it's been, uh, it's been driven in a, in a little bit different uh, fashion. Rex suddenly gained a new freedom and a whole new way of life. Now, because of this motorcycle, I, I don't feel like I'm handicapped. And because of this motorcycle, Rex and Fred can once again ride the roads together. At the top of the show, you saw a demonstration by the astounding sword swallower, Count Desmond. Well, swords aren't the only thing the Count has an appetite for. Here, once again, is Count Desmond. What's going to happen here is that I'm going to swallow a live microphone and I'll try to let you hear a few of the heartbeats. Crosby's going to come over and help me out here on the stage. Uh, she's a little nervous about this. Uh, good evening, Kathy. How are you feeling tonight? Not so well. She is actually going to shove this 23-inch <laughs> blade down my throat. When I perform in nightclubs around the world, I actually invite a total stranger out of the audience to insert this blade down the throat. I've almost been killed many times. Eighteen times I've had major injuries. <laughs> come back here. Eighteen times I've been carried out in the ambulance. Uh, I'm asking you to listen carefully as I describe exactly how I want this done because in a few moments my life will literally be in your hands. Well, what I'm going to do, I'll be on one knee. I'll be on one knee like this. And you'll be standing at my side in a few moments. For right now, stand right there as I show you how I want this done. I'll place the blade between my lips, like this. Hold it loosely, I'll move the blade around. When the angle is right, I take my hand away. Then you're just simply holding it in my mouth, loosely. I'll wait about five or six seconds. When I'm ready, I'll snap my fingers. Snap. And then take your hand away. I'll get the blade out. Now, do not jam it quickly. You will kill me very, very dead. 
All right, if you step over here real close now. Okay, I've wiped the blade off here. I'm going to put it between my lips, and you're going to have a hold of the handle, and remember to wait until I snap. Oh, I'm really nervous. Come over close. Get a hold of the handle. Next story began with a tragedy. It was 30 years ago that a courageous woman discovered she had only a few months left to live. It was typical of Lucille Frey that she thought first of others, especially her 10 children. Her final act led them to finding new homes and to a joyous reunion almost three decades later. In 1952, Lucille Frey of Ottumwa, Iowa, received the tragic news from her doctors. She was dying of cancer. Her immediate concern was that her husband Ivan could not take care of their 10 children. Ivan was crippled with severe arthritis. Lucille decided to find foster homes for them herself. When I was a young teenager, 14 years old, my mother told me that she was going to be dying with cancer and that we had to have new homes. We called a family meeting of all the brothers and sisters and it was explained to the youngest what was going to happen. She just said, I can't take care of you anymore because I was going home to be with Jesus, and she reassured us that uh, she would find us new mommies that would take care of us and love us as much as she did. Lucille Anderson of the American Cancer Society helped her select the homes. She said these homes had to be willing to accept her children and let them keep in touch with each other. That's why she didn't want them to go to an orphanage, because she was so afraid that they would not be allowed to keep in touch with each other. And then another rule was that the home in which they went had to be a Christian home. Uh, the father in the home had to have a good job and the family had to be willing to give her child an education. We really didn't seem to think maybe that it was really going to come to a reality until uh, one day, uh, a couple of people come to the door and uh, they wanted to take and see the baby. At that time, my brother Stephen was only about 18 months old and my mother kind of asked him uh, about their personal life and whether if they take the baby, if they would love him and, and uh, go by these standards that she wanted him to. And I think we made probably about three trips down there to see Steve. And we decided that's the one we wanted. And so she says, well, we'll start making arrangements. So she had contacted the, or the county attorney and set up adoption plans. And we uh, went down and picked her up that morning. And we went to the courthouse and we signed the papers that day. And we brought Stephen home with us that day. And that day he became our son. I think the hardest part was probably to give me away because knowing that I'd have no memory of her. That had to be hard. But when Stephen left, and wasn't not much longer after that, some other people came down and started looking at some of my other brothers and sisters, and uh, then it got important. And then, it, then it was real. And then Mom was also going to die. Stephen Frey was two years old when he became Stephen Handy. Warren was adopted by the Waymeyer family at age four. Linda was five and a half years old when she became Linda Kaiser. And Frank was six and a half when a home was found for him. Joyce Frey became Joyce O'Loughlin at age 10. Ivan was seven when he was welcomed into the Carbo family. Pauline was adopted by the Johnsons when she was 11, while the Burrell family welcomed 12-year-old Virginia into their home. Now Carl was 13 when he became Carl Miller. And the oldest, Joanne, was 14 when Richard and Cleta Thomas adopted her. Joanne had everything that uh, a charm and a child could have. And uh, we both fell in love with her right there. And uh, we'd taken her home that day if it had been our privilege, but uh, we had to go back the next week to get her. That weekend passed very quickly, watching the lake and um, uh, playing in the snow and meeting new people for the first time. And when I went back on that Sunday evening, 
My mother wanted to know if I could live in that home, and I said, yes, I could. And she was very proud of us all. The hard part to me was when we went down to pick her up. I thought that would be just terrible to see a mother and her daughter separated. I couldn't see how they could do that. And I almost felt guilty for separating them. But uh, they, they made it so easy. Uh, I'm certain that her heart was breaking, but she was uh, trying to do what in her mind was the right thing for her children and getting them into homes that she herself had seen and visited. It would be awfully hard uh, for, for any woman to have to give a baby up, let alone 10 of us. And so I know um, she had to be a very strong and loving mother in order to sacrifice her happiness for us kids. After each one had found their new home, she got on the bus and went around all over the state and visited each one of them in their new home, not as their mother, but more like an aunt, referring each child to their adoptive mother for answers to questions. And just one week after she returned to Ottumwa, she left us, satisfied that each of her children was being loved by someone. 28 years after they were separated, the Frey children would finally be reunited. We'll see more of this incredible story right after this. As her last gift to her children, Lucille Frey found good homes for each of them. 28 years later, That's Incredible and ABC arranged at long last to reunite the brothers and sisters. Carl was the first to arrive at the airport. One by one, the others came. The sisters and brothers who hadn't seen each other in nearly three decades. Oh, hi, Joanne! Joanne came, and then Virginia. Then Linda, Pauline, Stephen, Joyce, and Warren. At each arrival, the ritual of introductions and embraces began anew. A family separated was now becoming whole once again. We're pretty. Hi. Hi. Hello. Do you know Linda? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know Linda. Hi. Oh. Why don't you turn around and meet your brother? I'm your baby. Why are you Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You're your oldest sister? Yeah, you are. <laughs> we are so pleased to welcome eight of the children of Lucille Frey to our studio tonight. And I'd like to introduce all of them to you right now. Let's start over here. Joanne Samsel, Warren Waymeyer, Virginia Johnson, Carl Miller, Joyce Boyd, Linda McNatt, Pauline Dix, and Stephen Handy. Welcome to all of you. Well, of the ten children born to the Frey family, we have eight of you here. Uh, what has become of the other one? One has passed away, and then what has become of the other one? Stephen? Uh, Ivan Jr. is currently serving with the United States Army over in Korea. Well, actually, Ivan isn't in Korea. Not tonight, anyway. Tonight, the last member of the Frey family to finally be reunited with his brothers and sisters from the 2nd Aviation Battalion in Korea, let's welcome Sergeant Ivan Carbo. I think one of the first comments says, now he has to guess who we are. <laughs> Ivan, do you remember everybody here? They've aged quite a bit, but... Oh, uh, careful, careful. Sure are. <laughs> so <have> I. <laughs> the story is not over yet, and we're not quite through yet. We weren't the only ones moved by the story of Lucille Frey. It recently inspired a TV movie in which Anne Marger portrays the mother who, upon learning she hasn't longed to live, takes it upon herself to find new homes for her children. 
Frederick Forrest plays the father, and the movie's entitled, Who Will Love My Children? And I don't believe any of the Frey children have had a chance yet to, to see that film. Have you? No. All right, let's watch a, a little brief piece of film from that movie of the week. I saw Dr. Willis yesterday, and he said the cancer has spread. He, he took some x-rays, and he said it looked bad. What does that mean? It means I'm gonna die. Don't say that, because you're not gonna die. Don't even think like that. We have to make plans about what we're gonna do, because he says it's gonna go fast. Lucille, you're not gonna die. Don't pretend this is not gonna... You're not gonna I die! Need I help. promise you! But you're always promising me things! You can't promise me this one! It's just doctor talk, silly talk, and I don't wanna oh, hear it! Will you stop it? This one time, will you listen to me? We have to talk about the kids! Kids? What about the kids? Who's going to take care of them? Joanne, what did you think of the idea of having Anne Margaret portray your mother on screen? I was delighted. And the thing about it is she's been a favorite of mine for years. She's been a very sexy, neat lady. And I think if my father could have been here, he would have said my mother was sexy. Of course, having ten children, I'm sure he would have felt that way. But... <laughs> <laughs> I think he would have said also to Ann Margaret that there, he, she could put her shoes under his bed any time. <laughs> well, we have one last surprise. When word got out that we were reuniting the Frey family on our stage tonight, there was one person we could, just couldn't keep away. We are pleased to welcome the truly incredible Ms. Ann Margaret. And Margaret, come sit down with us here and, and we'll share some thoughts. I can't believe this is happening. This was your first movie of the week for television. What was it about this story that made you have to do this script? Uh, I knew the moment that I read this, there was just no discussion. I just felt like I was on a mission or something. I just knew I had to uh, portray this great lady that... Uh, with your mother. You obviously researched this part very well. What kind of woman was Lucille Frey? She was a great lady who uh, had such incredible love, selfless love, and uh, she had a fabulous sense of humor, and uh, she was courageous. She uh, was extremely strong. She had a deep, deep faith in the gentleman upstairs. And um, I just, as I've told everyone from the moment that I started this, that uh, I wanted to honor her and do her justice. And I felt a great, great responsibility to uh, all of you. And hey, Margaret, I'd love to ask you a question. What does it feel like to be with this family, uh, knowing they've been separated for 28 years? I just never knew that, um, I would have a chance to meet all of you. I'm just thrilled, I really am. And I want you to know something that uh, your mother's spirit is within me. She really is. And the spirit, her spirit, was on the set every single day. And I know she's here. And Margaret, thank you. We're as delighted as you are and we all are to see this family back together. Thank you, and Margaret, for joining us tonight. Thank you. You're about to see a most unusual race. Kathy Lee, why don't you tell them just exactly what our competitors will be driving? Well, sure. They'll be driving, uh, well, they're not exactly cars. They're not cars? Well, they're kind of like cars. Are they? Well, they have wheels. They have wheels. Well, some of them have wheels. Uh, why don't you watch this and see if you can figure out what they're driving? It's not easy to tell what anyone's driving or even what's going on. That's just the point. Welcome to the preliminaries of the annual Great Arcata de Ferndale Cross-Country Kinetic Sculpture Race. 
there is some method to this apparent madness. The vehicles are called kinetic sculptures, and the race will cover a 34-mile course that includes sand dunes, city streets, country roads, and Humboldt Bay, which is by far the most demanding leg. Contestants work for months to create their kinetic sculptures. Some, however, just like a grand entrance with a vehicle that's completely absurd. There's clearly not much chance of this racer ever finishing. Luckily, though, there are those who take this race much more seriously. name, the annual Great Arcata to Ferndale Kinetic Sculpture Race begins in the town of Arcata and ends in the town of Ferndale. After this water crossing, there'll be miles more to go, but no one's especially worried because anything can happen in a race with a two-day time limit. to predict who will actually win the annual Great Arcata to Ferndale cross-country kinetic sculpture race. But if you're one of the few who care, it's never too late to place your bets. moment, John Davis had a good job, a good home, and a wonderful family. But he lost it all when a car accident reduced him to an unemployable derelict. We'll show you the courage that turned his life around. When that's incredible, continues. The frightening part of this next story is that it could have happened to any of us. John Davis II was happy, he was successful, he was respected. What could possibly happen to take all that away from him? Just some ice on the roadway. What could get it all back? Just some incredible courage. In 1964, at the age of 31, John Davis had it made. He'd struggled from an impoverished childhood to become a wealthy man. He was the personal lawyer of West Virginia's governor, and he counted among his friends some of the most powerful and wealthy people in America. John Davis was young and brilliant, and the world was going his way. I went to private island with a few other people. I had airplanes, had cars, had too many cars. I had um, uh, houseboats. Uh, I had several homes that uh, I let my uh, wife's parents live in and property throughout the state. I was in business uh, with a very prominent man here in West Virginia. And everything to me looked not only coming up roses, it looked like it was sparkling diamonds. Then in December of that year, John's car hit some ice and slammed into an abutment. For three days, he drifted in and out of consciousness. His face had been severely lacerated, his skull fractured. But that was the least of it. John had suffered brain damage. It was an insidious form which doctors said was incurable and progressively degenerative. The doctors prescribed at least a year of rest, free from stress and strain. For a man like John Davis, a quiet life, a calm life, was unthinkable. He was at the peak of his career, a career he'd worked hard for. He wasn't willing to give up, and so he continued working, but he paid a heavy price. He became very difficult to live with. He was impulsive. You couldn't deal with him. And... Gradually, our relationship deteriorated. Then John began to experience frequent seizures. They were a predictable effect of his deteriorating condition. At any time, I could start to begin these seizures, and it was just unbelievable agony and pain. And it would distort my body, and 
terrorized me. The terror was soothed by alcohol, yet by 1969, John barely resembled the man that bartender Shug Davis had once known. I met John Davis, oh, maybe about uh, 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I could tell from his shoes and stuff that he, what he had on, how, how nice, you know, that he was probably, you know, a big shot guy. And then all of a sudden, he started jumble talking. And I got to notice, and I said, well, maybe something's wrong with you, you understand me? During the next three years, John's behavior became increasingly bizarre. Restaurant owner Cecil Johnson remembers. One time, he brought in a bag of money and set it down and ordered something to eat. I asked him, I said, John, where'd you get all this money? Oh, don't pay no attention to it. Well, he's done the same thing. We got it too scribbling around. He got up and walked off, left the bag. He never come back to him. During those days, John gave away hundreds of thousands of dollars. His erratic behavior forced an end to his marriage. He, um, became very irresponsible. Um, and I didn't think there was anything else left in our relationship, so we ended it. With his wife and family gone, John found a life of quiet desperation on Charleston Skid Row. The life that he once led was now a blurry memory, and it wasn't long before he found himself in jail. I ended up there in that year, 1969, in the city jail in Charleston, West Virginia, in the felony wards, a place I'd never been beforehand place I couldn't conceive of ever going to be with about 20 other felons. John Davis was never convicted of a crime, but his behavior in jail was uncanny. One Christmas Eve, he used his own money to bail his cellmates out. John, however, chose to stay behind. Jail at that time seemed to suit him. He was a man apart from the world, a prisoner of his own mind. Life in jail or life on the street seemed his only choices for comfort. It was a trauma for those who loved him. One time I was walking down the street and he came up to me and asked me to, my name was my name. I gave him five dollars, it was all I had. And so it was that I, who had been a personal guest in the White House, and now found myself a bum, I guess you'd say, in West Virginia, in the streets carrying all the possessions I had in a little box, and I sleep in the night in an alley sometime. John considered suicide. It seemed the only option. His deteriorating mind had impaired his ability to speak, to think, to control his body's movements. And though he was now still licensed to practice law, that too would be taken away. Uh, we sent the case to a special master who took evidence and concluded that indeed John was medically unable to practice law, uh, we suspended him with leave to apply for readmission once a year, every year thereafter, uh, with supporting medical evidence. Suspension from the bar was a devastating blow to John. It rocked him enough to seek out the help of his longtime family physician. John uh, wanted to know if he would be able to regain his license in the, in the coming year. And at that time, uh, his condition had been de deteriorating uh, more rapidly, and I, I told, frankly told John that uh, unless he changed his lifestyle around, uh, he might, may not have a year to do it in, uh, and, I, and he'd be ready for the box. It was now 1977. John paid a visit to the local cemetery where he'd often slept at night. I remember walking through the older part of the cemetery, seeing the gravestones knowing that over in the potter's field portion, I'd soon be buried there and there wouldn't be any gravestone for me. I thought I heard someone say, listen. And I looked, I turned my head and I looked up and there was the angel's face. It's the first time in my life I ever knew that I wasn't a stranger and afraid in a world I never made. I learned more in that brief second, that brief touch of eternity that I've learned in all my years. It was as though my whole body, my brain itself, was self-organizing, reorganizing. And although it was a long, long way back, 
the fundamental truth I got there. Be not afraid of the universe. John borrowed books from the library. He studied the nature of man. He learned of the complex workings of the brain, of the powers of the mind. He decided to make a concerted attempt at restoring his shattered life. Let my intuition, my instincts, guide me. I ran, I spun, I held my breath as long as I could. I prayed, I fasted, and slowly, surely, I could feel myself rising up out of this dark cavern, back to the light. The pieces of my own inner world began, began to come together. And I began to regain not only uh, some abilities, but some self-respect and deep confidence uh, that I had never truly had before because I had never felt that there was anyone out there before but me. And so he began writing letters to me, analyzing certain economic and philosophical problems. I found the letters enormously interesting. And so I began to write back without even realizing what his uh, particular condition was. John had some of the more interesting ideas that I had read. So by 1979 or 80, we had engaged in a correspondence where a large number of very long letters, almost a 19th century type correspondence, uh, had, had been exchanged. Uh, the state bar was convinced that he had completely recovered from his medical problems. And of course, at that time, the state Supreme Court was very pleased to reinstate him to the bar and reissue his license to practice law. I have discovered that any human being, uh, once they make the decision to take control and to take responsibility for themselves, any human being, by their own uh, efforts, can improve whatever condition they have, maybe not as well as I can have, maybe better. And they can do it and they can continue to do it. It's been 17 years since his accident, since his physical and emotional collapse, and John Davis is back. He has started a brand new law firm, and to the astonishment of everyone, he is living a whole new life. I don't think that through all the hardships that we ever really quit being a family. And it was just the logical thing, if you're gonna to be together, you gotta to have everyone together. Another happy footnote, the Davis family is together again. You know, that's incredible mailbag was this letter from Carl E. Bennett, and the other prisoners serving time in camp number 11 at the Virginia State Road Camp. Carl writes, as on every Monday night, we watched your show, and as always, it brought to us a mental and emotional release from our present environment. However, it was a very deep and moving experience as we watched the reunion of the two brothers and sister. I was filled with emotions which brought goosebumps to my skin. As I looked around, I saw a reflection of my feelings in everyone here. Who said criminals have no feelings for others? Trustin Howard, who lives in Canoga Park, California, writes, the feet of the Frenchman eating a whole bicycle on your show was quite impressive. Now I'd like to challenge him to a real test. I'd like him to try to eat my wife's cooking. <laughs> Sorry, Trustin, this is that's incredible, not that's inedible. <laughs> if you have something incredible to share with us, or even something inedible, here's the address to write. Post Office Box 25989, Los Angeles, California, zip code 90025, and please include your phone number. If we read it on the air, you'll receive a That's Incredible jacket, like this one, and a box of That's Incredible books. Now here's a preview of the weeks ahead. Bruce Kimball was a championship diver until a car accident left him unable to even walk. Everyone thought his diving career was finished. Everyone but Bruce. These men are working on an incredible invention. Three-dimensional television without glasses. We'll show you a sample right on your own TV. These video game champions are battling to see who will be the That's Incredible King of the Joystick. So don't miss the first ever That's Incredible video game invitation. We'd like to thank our guests for this week. Hal Desmond. The Frey family. The Incredible Ann Margaret. 
That's it for this week. See you next time on... That's Incredible. Good night. This is David Hartman. Tomorrow on Good Morning America, Crime in America, Why Do Criminals Commit Crime? Also, singer turned actor Mac Davis. Later this week, the wonderful Meryl Streep on Good Morning America. Thursday, if you thought they made terrible neighbors last week, this week they're in-laws when the kids tell them they were secretly married on Condo. Then, larceny checks into Amanda's when an ex-con holds up the hotel. Now stay tuned for Who Will Love My Children, next.